Is it okay to go? So, um, well, we've got some latecomers, it seems. So, welcome all so much to, to CIPRI uh, this morning. My name is Jacob Holgren. I'm the deputy director here at, at CIPRI. It's a real pleasure to see such a full uh, room. Uh, and I'd also like to extend a particular welcome to those of you those of us who are following uh, this online. We've got a live broadcast at, at the end of the room. Today's theme is a conversation on Afghanistan and its road to peace. Um, after almost 40 years of conflict and, and challenges uh, uh, in, in, in Afghanistan, uh, the issues are really uh, well, enormous. Um, whether challenges to peace, security, development, humanitarian concerns, economic growth, or long-term sustainability. Uh, we're now about two years after the official end of the NATO combat operations in Afghanistan, and two years into the National Unity Government. And I think now is quite a good time to start to take, take stock of where the country is, is going. And I'd say that while it is uh, probably, probably true to say that the international community may have shifted a lot of its immediate concern to places like the Ukraine, to Syria, to Iraq, there's obviously still a lot of institutional memory internationally and great interest and concern for how the situation in Afghanistan evolves. A lot of resources have been invested in the country over the last 15 years, apparently, as we might hear more about in a moment, with mixed results. A lot of lessons have been learned. Uh, and I think the international community is acutely aware of the need to stand by Afghanistan on its uh, path to, to sustainable peace. And that the memories of what happened in the, when the international, international community turned its back to Afghanistan in the early 1990s, I think, are very much alive. I am very proud to introduce a, an extremely interesting panel here around me, uh, who with their respective perspectives will help us understand uh, the current challenges and opportunities in, of, for Afghanistan better. First of all, we're especially honored here at CIPRI to have Deputy Foreign Minister Hekmat Karzai here. Uh, you're a scholar by training, prolific writer, founder of the Center for Conflict and Peace Studies in Kabul. And you're now since almost two years the Deputy Foreign Minister, I believe. Thank you so much for being here. Please. Secondly, we are extremely pleased to have Mrs. Pernille Dahler Cardell here. You are a prominent Danish diplomat and ambassador to, among other places, Egypt and Ethiopia, I understand. <coughs> and since this summer, the deputy SRSG for political affairs for UNAMA, the UN mission in, in Afghanistan. Uh, we're also very pleased to have His Excellency <coughs> Anders Sjöberg, Sweden's ambassador to Afghanistan here. You uh, arrived in 2015, but have worked for many years on uh, Afghanistan and the region, including in India. Then it's our great pleasure to have you, Dr. Barnett Rubin, on this panel. You are an oracle on Afghanistan <laughs> and uh, <laughs> formerly the senior <laughs> fellow and associate director of the New York University Center on International the Cooperation. And, and, uh, and its program on Afghanistan and, and Afghanistan. And I think you have, uh, <coughs> among many things, also served as a special advisor to, to the, uh, uh, or senior advisor even, to the, to the special representative of, uh, of, on Afghanistan of the US president. Last, but certainly not least, uh, we have uh, Mr. Richard Giassi. You're a colleague of mine, an eminent CIPRI researcher who has written and worked uh, widely on Afghanistan, both before joining CIPRI and, uh, and also currently. Last year, you co-authored a, a report on uh, 
the e private sector in Afghanistan, and you're currently working on the so-called one, one Belt, One Road uh, initiative, which obviously also spans over, over Afghanistan. Uh, we're so glad to have you here, and we're really looking forward to this morning's uh, discussion. And uh, I'd like to organize the uh, conversation in the following way, that we'd, uh, I suggest we start with the challenges and the obstacles to, to, to peace. And then I'll put a couple of tailored questions, and then we'll move our ways toward, uh, towards the opportunities <coughs> and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the chances that, that things might improve. Um, so, um, if I force you a little, Mr. Karzai, we're after all talking about the country with almost insurmountable uh, challenges. From, from, from your vantage point, what, what do you see as the current main domestic and foreign factors that the deter uh, Afghanistan's path to, to peace and, and stability? Sure. Bismillah rahman rahim Jacob and Excellencies, colleagues, uh, let me just say that it is indeed a pleasure to be in Cypri. Uh, this is an institution that I have admired uh, for years and years. Uh, as Jacob mentioned, I was director of a peace institute uh, in Kabul. Uh, so this for me is like a homecoming. So I want to be able to connect and, and engage with everyone. Second, uh, this is my first official trip to Sweden, uh, and I'm truly honored to be here. Uh, Sweden is a small country, but with an enormous heart. Uh, the amount of assistance that you have provided to Afghanistan, whether it's through Swedish Committee for Afghanistan or the fact that we uh, Afghans are the largest recipient of your aid is something that we Afghans will not forget. Uh, we are grateful friends. Uh, you have lost six soldiers, uh, and their lives uh, have not gone in vain. Uh, they, they are lives that we, as Afghans, will remember as your friends. Now uh, to the question that Jacob asked. Uh, in the last 15 years, I think, uh, we have had uh, different challenges to deal with. Uh, we have had uh, different perspectives. Uh, we have focused on Afghanistan for certain times, and then our focus was off Afghanistan. And then at one point, we had to come back to Afghanistan. And I think if one of the greatest lessons we can learn from the last at least two decades is that uh, you know, Afghanistan is going to find its way back uh, into the news, uh, whether it was after the Cold War, where Afghanistan was abandoned, uh, or uh, whether it was after 9-11, where things were going really well, uh, the focus was shifted to Iraq. And even now, I think uh, one of the greatest challenge that we see now is there's enormous amount of focus on militant and violent groups such as Daesh and Al-Qaeda, particularly Daesh. Uh, and one of the things that we really see is that once sanctuaries for Daesh are eliminated in places like Syria and Iraq, they're going to start looking for other sanctuaries. And this is why I think our region, particularly Afghanistan and Pakistan, is, is crucial. Let me highlight three particular uh, challenges that we faced. First, we still face uh, a very serious problem of international terrorism. Many of the international groups, whether you call them as Al-Qaeda, whether you look at Daesh, whether you look at ETIM, which is the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement, which operates in China, whether you also look at many of these groups, all of them still operate and, and, and fight in Afghanistan. Uh, it is an opportunity for them to develop uh, their links, their networks, and from there to go to other places. That's one. Second, there is, in our region, institutional support for these groups. Uh, some of these groups are provided sanctuary, logistical infrastructure, uh, and financial support. So that seems to be uh, the second problem specifically. The third issue is about better governance and better delivery. And that is something that uh, we are learning. We are uh, trying to make sure that we're able to do a better job at it. Uh, but at the same time, I think if you look at the history of the last 15 years, we've had four elections, which uh, you know, thus far has improved the lives of people. Uh, I think if you look at just very basic numbers, 
You know, we have 9 million children going to schools. And, you know, 35% of them are girls. That is an enormous statement that we could not make 15 years ago. We have women participation uh, on so many levels in the government. We have four ministers. We have five ambassadors. You know, we have on so many different levels that, you know, uh, the gender empowerment is taking place. So things have changed, but I think there are uh, difficulties that we need to focus on. But it cannot be done just by Afghans themselves. They need the support uh, and partnership of, of our international friends. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, keeping it uh, brief and, and to the point. Thanks for these three points. If I may turn to you now, Ms. Cardinal, uh, do, do, you, do you agree with, uh, with, uh, with Mr. Kasai's uh, uh, assessment here? Or what do you see as the, the key uh, factors that deter if we now start with, with that kind? Well, um, first and foremost, I think I would like also to thank you for the invitation for, for being <coughs> here today. I think it is incredibly timely again and again to have an opportunity to, to discuss what is it that hampers and what are the opportunities around peace in Afghanistan. Because on a daily basis, um, we keep to so, Sorry, I think there's an issue with your microphone, actually. I'm so sorry. You want this out of here? Yeah. No, you can keep it. I'll just put it Technical here. pause. Yeah. <laughs> you can hear me now. Yeah, no, but just, uh, just, very, just very briefly to say thank you for the invitation for, for being here today mm. and particularly for picking up on the discussion about what it is that, that deters and, and are of opportunities for peace in Afghanistan. Because I think on a daily basis, certainly in Yunama, um, the, the daily work um, of leads us to focus on, on you know, day-to-day -day issues and, and mm. concerns. And, and, and very rarely do we get a chance to actually stop up and say, wait a second, the reason why we're here is because of the missing piece. When we have fulfilled what we are there to do, we've worked very closely with the Afghan government and, and <coughs> supported their efforts to, and the efforts of the Afghan people to, to make peace in Afghanistan. So it's, it's, it's a very, very useful opportunity to, to, uh, to be in this discussion. And certainly also for me, having now been with Yonama for, for five months, which is a short time, um, and, but a time where you know, it's, it's, it's a good time to mm. reflect on that. Um, and I think it's important that to, to remember that without a just and sustainable peace in Afghanistan, all the work that has been done over the last uh, many years to, by the Afghan government and the Afghan people and with the support from the international community could be lost. So it's in, in, that, in that lens that, that, uh, that um, we try to, uh, to look at, at the work that we do. But I very much agree with the points raised by the Deputy Foreign Minister. I think um, when, when I look at it, um, Certainly, I mean, uh, the battlefield as such, um, there's, there's, if you look at it, and again, what kind of measuring stick are we using? And that's, that's, that's one of the things that can be difficult. But, but if we are looking to the battlefield as providing a mutually hurting stalemate, um, there's reasons to believe that it's going in that direction, that, that mm. it's actually, it's, it's actually uh, considering the challenges that the Afghan uh, National Security Forces have been up against, it has not been going as badly as one could certainly have feared if we had sat here two years ago. And that brings us in a direction of creating possibly internally mm. in Afghanistan what it takes uh, for, to create some basic parameters for peace. And at the same time, also the, the signing of the peace agreement with the uh, Hezbollah Islami Hekmatyar um, was an encouraging step. Yes, there's issues, and we'll get back to that possibly, but it, but it did indicate a very strong uh, desire from the Afghan government. I think that that peace is peace is 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 a goal and is something that you know the Afghan government goes far to achieve. I think I would also like to pick up on one of the issues that uh, the deputy foreign minister mentioned, and that is the presence of Daesh in in Afghanistan, with the with the various aspects of that. And I think one of the one of the fears that we have right now is that the possible sectarian divide, which is not a natural in an Afghan society, mm -hmm. but that's being instilled by the way Daesh is approaching their, their activities in Afghanistan, um, that, that is one of the things that, that, that could again add another level of complexity to, on the road mm -hmm. towards uh, peace. And on the regional side, certainly, I mean, Afghanistan has this unfortunate history of everybody being involved for other reasons than Afghanistan, and that complex picture continues to play itself out. Um, and, and something that uh, in the, the Heart of Asia meeting just took place, and, and again, there's a good discussion, etc. but there's key issues there with the regional players to, to create uh, 
the notion of the importance of peace in Afghanistan for the sake of peace in Afghanistan, mm. that, that, that is a challenge. And the last thing I want to mention too is, is on the issue of governance, that it is a difficult thing for the, for the government to, to deliver. There's, there's results, there's progress. But, it, but the national unity government, you know, the more time is spent on trying to make the very top level function, the less time can be spent on actually delivering to the Afghan people. And there's only so much time in that time glass kind of thing. Um, so, so the importance of, get, of, of really getting the govern governance agenda going and, mm. and on the delivery of that. And I'll stop mm. here too and mm. look forward to discussing yeah. the, fu the, the prospects of future. So. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Carl. Very, very useful. I mean, you're essentially saying that you know, it could have been worse. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll turn to the opportunities in in the while in a while. But but it's uh, of course uh, uh, true. I mean, the, what you highlight about the dash and its possible uh, well uh, bigger significance in the in the country is certainly something we should look out for. Uh, Ambassador Shoberg, may may I turn to to you now and and you as the the last of the three persons representing uh, official uh, positions and government positions here. Do, do you agree with the Deputy Foreign Minister and, and, and the Deputy SRSG here? In, in, or what's, what's the Swedish assessment uh, when it comes to the factors okay that not deter? To huh? <laughs> <laughs> Anders, please. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for in, inviting. I think yeah. this is a great opportunity for... Is this working? Um, yeah. So, well, so you, you get to visit as well. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I could only hear myself. <laughs> so it's a, it's a great opportunity for <coughs> us to focus on, on Afghanistan. And of course, as yeah. a Swedish ambassador, I, th I find it's very useful that we also uh, reach out uh, both globally with, through yeah. internet, but also through a, a very prominent audience here. Yeah. Um, my, you know, I, I very much support uh, what uh, what the deputy uh, foreign minister and uh, and the uh, deputy <coughs> SRSG has has said here in their uh, first interventions. But I would like to pick up on a couple of things. One is, and, and this, I, I, you know, I must come to the opportunities because there are so many we'll opportunities. We'll, yeah, <laughs> sure. we'll get there. We'll yeah, stay yeah, with yeah. the. Yeah. But one thing now. that I want to highlight, yeah. that, you, that we have a, a highly competent uh, uh, government in, in place. And uh, Minister Kazai is, is an excellent example of this. So there, i there is a, a government there uh, to, uh, to, to govern, and uh, that is a very good start if you are in a country uh, which has some you know, seri very serious challenges inside the country, and also uh, in, in the neighborhood. Then, coming to the, the challenges, uh, of course, uh, one is uh, the, the regional context, uh, the, the lack of trust and confidence among uh, regional uh, players. We are just back from the Heart of Asia uh, conference, uh, which took pla place in Amritsar this year. Uh, we see that uh, regional players do interact, but there is also a hi high level of, of distrust between the parties. So one, uh, I think one very important step that was made by the government was uh, earlier this year and, and, and last year when, when this QCG, the four nation talks, uh, took off as an attempt to, to build trust between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, but also with the support of, of the U.S. And, 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 and China in this process. Uh, coming to the governance issues, I think uh, there has been a lot of progress on the national level, but I, I do agree that this is a big, big challenge, uh, in particular at the local level, when it comes to service <coughs> delivery. And one of the big challenges here is the, the judicial system, where you have a direct competition with, uh, with the insurgency, which are providing their, their form of, of uh, judiciary support to, to the local people, and where you have uh, very uh, <coughs> little traction from the, from, from the government side. So these are some of the challenges that, that, that I see and that I could come back to as well. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why, why, why the lack of, of service delivery out in the, in the region as you see it? It's, uh, if I may say, it's a, it's a relatively weak state and uh, it's building 
you know, it's, it's being now formed uh, and uh, quite rapidly at the national level, but then to reach out uh, mm. uh, at the local level, it's, it's, it's far more difficult. And you also have <coughs> uh, uh, several areas that are conte contested and a few areas that are also in control and by, by the insurgents. Mm. And of course, the it's, mm. it's, it's very difficult to reach out to these places where you don't have proper control. So it's both about the security dimension to mm. it, but it's also about you know, ha having the capacity at, at local level to provide these services. You're actually the first that, that mentioned the insurgency among the deterring uh, factors here, but, but uh, interesting uh, uh, to hear. And uh, you'll obviously, in a, in a moment, Deputy Foreign Minister, get an opportunity to, to comment on this. But before that, I'd like to turn to our two um, academics and scholars on, on the panel. And if I may start with you, uh, Dr. Rubin. Well, you have the benefit of being a scholar, and you've studied the countries for so many years. Uh, do you do you agree with uh, what the, the three pr three previous interventions have have uh, concluded, uh, your colleagues well, here on the panel? Well, first, let me echo my predecessors in saying how pleased and honored I am to be not just in Cypri but also in Swe in Sweden, uh, which has been a very important resource and support <coughs> for all the work that I've done in Afghanistan for over thirty years. So it's very uh, appropriate to be here. Um, well, of course, everything that they have said is true. The problem in Afghanistan is not the difficulty of identifying obstacles to peace. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm going to identify a few more. It's, uh, it's trying to uh, figure out where there is some leverage and what is the political content of that peace, because there's no such thing as apolitical peace. Everyone wants peace if it consists of their ruling over their enemies. Um, first of all, as, as you mentioned, Afghanistan is a weak state, which is not the result of the current government or any particular government. It's a historical fact of mm. the way the country was, was delineated, its economy, its geography, and so on. And it is a landlocked state, which means that the only way that it can uh, be, that the state can strengthen itself sustainably uh, will be by building the economy up through cooperation with its neighbors. Mm. Okay. And given the relationships among its neighbors, cooperation with one neighbor often leads to suspicion with another neighbor. Next, in the interim period, while it's still such a weak government and uh, a weak state, not government, a weak state and um, dependent on external assistance, it can, while it is trying to build this, the, this network of regional cooperation, it requires quite huge assistance from the United States and the rest of the formal international community. However, the United States in particular is regarded as a threat by many of Afghanistan's neighbors. And therefore, reconciling the need for regional cooperation with the need of, for a commitment from the United States is quite difficult. That's become even more difficult with the growth of Daesh in Afghanistan, because that has led a number of, of regional players, in particular Iran and Russia, to shift their strategies vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban and the government and so on. Perhaps we can discuss that a little bit later. Now, uh, just briefly, I think that there also is a very possible uh, uh, there, there are some unknown changes that will take place in the relationship between Afghanistan and the United States as a result of the change of administration in the United States. Mm. And I will just generally observe that often when I talk to uh, non-Americans about this, I detect what, from my point of view, is unwarranted optimism about <laughs> what the next administration will do, hoping, projecting that it will be a continuation of the past in some way. I do mm. not believe that it will be. I'll Honestly, I'm speaking as a complete opponent of, of uh, Donald Trump, uh, so I have a bias. I'll lay it right out there. But he has not been some. He has said that he pretty clearly that he does not want to have a long-term commitment to any foreign countries, including Afghanistan. He said he'd keep the troops there begrudgingly. He's not a big fan of foreign aid. Um, his national security advisor is very uh, is not just anti-terrorism, but is quite rapidly anti-Muslim, and he has aroused significant racist and anti-Islamic passions in the United States so that we have seen a in rapid increase in hate crimes since the election. 
which will have an, uh, ultimately have an impact on the ability of the United States to cooperate with Muslim countries. Because we've seen in, in, in the past several years, whenever there was a Quran burning, for instance, in the United States or carried out by, uh, uh, in, inadvertently by American soldiers in Afghanistan, that led to a very harsh reaction. I think, unfortunately, we have to expect uh, more of those. Now, there, on the positive side, which we'll get to later, I'll just say a word, the, the, uh, on the regionally, the rate of investment and development of infrastructure uh, and so on has really taken off in the past year or two, which I might add, and I might add that building infrastructure with billions of dollars of dubious loans that will never be paid off is something that Donald Trump will understand very well. <laughs> Thank you for bringing in the American perspective, uh, Dr. And uh, American uh, perspective. And American. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, we, I didn't say that, but obviously there's going to be time for some questions after the end of, of, of the interventions here, at the end of the, of the session. Uh, Richard, how do you uh, see this? How do you see the obstacles? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I'd like to break <coughs> it down in, say, the domestic level and the foreign level. So at the domestic level, Afghanistan finds itself in a deadlock, and this deadlock consists of three simultaneously and mutually reinforcing crises. Political crisis, security crisis, and a socioeconomic crisis. The political crisis is to a large extent driven by a rather large number of officials who place subnational interests above national interests, thereby paralyzing the ability of the government to execute its tasks. The security crisis is largely characterized by a, say, a stalemate between <coughs> the Afghan forces and the armed opposition. This stalemate could, if left unchanged, continue for quite a number of years. The socioeconomic crisis is largely characterized by a very small, relatively insignificant formal economy that has limited in capacity and scope to contribute to the government's tax base. The informal sector is rather large and rather self-sustained. The illicit sector is still thriving. Now to break this deadlock and I think we can count on the economy or the forces or the international community on its own and either Afghan civil society. I think the pivotal cog in all of this is the Afghan government with the support of the international <coughs> community, obviously. But for this to happen, I would say that the, the bickering and the plotting and the scheming that goes on should discontinue and national interests should be placed above all else. So this is the domestic level. At the foreign level, I would argue that the relationship between India and Pakistan continue to hijack the interests of South Asia to a too large extent. It works destabilizing, it hinders integration, and it results in certain proxy activities. Afghanistan is a victim of this relationship. So unless the relationship between India and Pakistan, the main drivers of the disputes that they have, is addressed, I would argue that peace and stability in Afghanistan will be, at least in a sustainable fashion, hard to achieve. Thank you. Richard, thank you. You're laying out quite a, a magnificent uh, number of, of challenges there. So I think it's only fair that we come back to you, uh, Mr. Karzai, Deputy Foreign Minister, and obviously you will get an opportunity to comment on what has, has come up uh, so far. But I'd also like to continue the conversation by, by asking you about the fact that there's been, as alluded to, directly or indirectly, quite some 
international reflection on the cohesiveness and maybe the effectiveness of the national unity government of which you are a government minister, cabinet minister, and, and also, I believe, with uh, the dynamic with the, with the parliament. So, so how, how grounded do you, do you think this uh, criticism is? And, and the second question, if I may, we mentioned, we mentioned briefly the insurgency, and, 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 and could you maybe say something about the status of the, of the peace process with the, the armed opposition as, as now? Well, that's uh, a mouthful, I know, but, but you can, <laughs> would be, yeah, 30 that's seconds, no. But <laughs> please, that's, please, that's three Mr. questions there. Yeah. Sure. Uh, no, I, I agree with the criticism that is, uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, being directed towards national unity government. Mm. Uh, but I also put the statement forward that uh, we are in uncharted territory. This is something we have absolutely no experience in, uh, in terms of having coalition governments, uh, in terms of having a system where you have to work together with your partner. And I think there are a lot of difficulties that we have to come to a realization with. There are also challenges in terms of having a system uh, that thus far was a very strong presidential system. And now all of a sudden, you have this additional figure uh, also responsible for uh, identifying and for implementing certain level of authority. I think we have not come to a grip of uh, specifically uh, the level of authority that the, you know, the chief executive need to exert. So I think there, there has been some difficulties, but in the last couple of weeks, things have been coming together. There have been regular discussions, and there, there are progress that I think is being made. So I'm optimistic on that. Regarding the insurgency, mm -hmm. I think, as some of you may know, that at the end of 2014, uh, in first month of uh, 2015, the Afghan security forces took the entire responsibility of security on their own shoulder. Now, please mind you that we had 150,000 foreign troops. Yeah. That is an enormous number. And this number uh, came from over 100,000 soldiers from the United States, plus the rest of the international community, uh, with Sweden, of, Sweden being one of the countries. Uh, for the past two years, I think there was these perceptions out there, particularly in the region, that within the first three months or six months, the latest, the security structure is going to collapse. Uh, we're, we're going to have the insurgency control enormous amount of territory. There will be territorial gains. Uh, there will be enormous amount of, of uh, provinces falling. Uh, many capitals will go down to... to the insurgency. Uh, there was also a heavy objective uh, towards bringing the Taliban leadership from the outside so they can operate from the inside. Uh, so, so there was this grand perspective uh, of, of you know, the security apparatus completely uh, sort of falling apart. Almost uh, two and a half years later, we have not seen that. Mm. We have not seen that. And uh, what's the international presence down to now? Remind about 8,000 400 soldiers, mm. uh, the American soldiers, and then about uh, 3,000 international, mm. uh, additional international forces, which include, of course, uh, German, British, and, and a few soldiers from uh, uh, Scandinavian countries. So combination of, of, <coughs> of support from uh, the coalition forces and uh, the Afghan security sector, we have been able to deal with the insurgency, but I would agree that we have reached a point where we would call it a strategic stalemate. Uh, mm -hmm. We do not feel within the government that there is a military victory. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no military solution to the conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, and we're realistic about that. Uh, so that's why our doors for peace has always been uh, open. We have reached out in two parallel tracks. First, we have reached out to many of the militant groups that are operating in the region, that are operating in Afghanistan. And uh, the success of one of the engagements that we recently had was, of course, our, our uh, agreement with Hizb Islami. Mm. Uh, for those who do not know Hizb Islami, this has been one of the uh, anti-resistance movement against anti 
uh, Russian movement uh, when the Russians invaded Afghanistan. Hizb Islami was one of the groups that fought against the Russians and then eventually stayed engaged until even <coughs> now. Uh, they are led by uh, a person by the name of Gulbuddin Hikmatyar, who has been a prime minister for several times, but at the same time now wants to come and join the government. For us, the reason why this peace process has been significant and why productive is that because we see this as a lesson mm. to move forward. Mm. We see this as an experience to proceed uh, with a much more complicated mm. and a difficult process. One of the things that we have done now is that the deal that we have made, the peace process that we have uh, engaged in with Hezbo Islami, uh, we made a, a particular benchmark that they have to accept the Afghan constitution. Mm. And Hezbo Islami has accepted the Afghan constitution. So thus far, things have been going in a positive direction uh, with Hezbo Islami. Now, one of the things that we are trying to do is to engage uh, a much b bigger group responsible for a much bigger level of violence which is the Taliban, and I think the efforts that we have been undertaken, uh, there are positive signs to proceed. Mm. Well, sometimes you argue that in conflicts when, when both sides reach a stalemate and when they mm. realize that there's no further gains really to be made, by even mm. including with a lot of extra resources and efforts, that's when the conditions are beginning to get ripe for, for, for at least the willingness to, to sit down and, and, and discuss. Are, are, are there discussions ongoing or how far away from, mm. from that are we? Mm. We have had discussions. Uh, you see, for the past two years, there have been several tracks that mm. we have undertaken. Mm. Uh, after uh, the National Union government came into office, uh, it engaged the region heavily. Mm. Uh, we went to China, we went to Saudi Arabia, uh, we went to, to India to try to create this consensus uh, on the stability in Afghanistan. We also went to Pakistan, and it is with Pakistan that we started enormous amount of dialogue, back and forth. Uh, we invested extensive amount of political will mm. in our relationship with Pakistan. Uh, we sent for the first time in the history, we sent our soldiers to Pakistan for training. We allowed Pakistani soldiers to come and interrogate violent militants that we arrested. Uh, but at the same time, on the Pakistani side, sadly, we did not see any reciprocity. Uh, we continue to see enormous amount of violence stemming from Pakistan directed at us. And particularly uh, in light of what's happening now, uh, there is still enormous amount of infrastructure in Pakistan that continues to be provided to these various militant groups. So on one side, we have stopped expecting Pakistan to deliver. Mm. We have engaged with the Taliban directly. Mm. Uh, we have had specific conversations with the Taliban, direct engagement, and we will continue to have direct engagements. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, we also see the desire and the need uh, for a reaching out to the region to make sure that at the end of the day, any deal that is made is blessed by the region. Mm. Thanks. Um, I'd like to. Um, yeah, you Barney. Want to, you want to have like a conversation? Yeah, yeah I. <coughs> we could. I have. Uh, yeah, please. I have another question as well. But, but, Dr. Barney, please. Well, yeah. I think that um, Hikmat's answer illustrates one of the problems, which I think it's worth stating specifically, which is, this is not a conflict with only two parties. Uh, uh, and, and, it, and it, it's a and not so it, it, just those two parties becoming exhausted is not sufficient um, and each of those two par and of all the parties none of them agrees on who the parties to the conflict are the Taliban believe they're fighting the United States the Afghan government believes they're fighting Pakistan Pakistan is very unclear about who is fighting whom but it, it claims that it's a uh, you know, the Af corrupt Afghan government fighting against the Af Afghan Taliban. Then, from this difference <coughs> comes proposals for different formats for talks. And whatever format has been tried so far, someone else in the region objects to it. If Pakistan is in, if Pakistan is out, if China is in, if Russia is out, okay, someone objects to it. So, uh, that, and there is no power that 
uh, combines both the legitimacy of the United Nations and the power of the United States and some others that can resolve those things themselves. And that is why Hikmat and others spend so much time going around the region to major capitals trying to uh, coordinate this. But it's a much more difficult problem than just resolving a conflict between two pro parties. Thanks for that uh, remark. Um, may I maybe with this turn to uh, our two representatives here of the international uh, community and also widening it. I mean, Deputy Foreign Minister, you mentioned the uh, well, the international military presence, how it's gone down from 150 to barely or a bit more than 10,000. Now, uh, recently we've seen quite a few uh, reports being uh, released on the lessons learned of that enormous and extraordinary, I would say. I saw that it was the United States' longest war uh, engagement in, in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, where, l um, I mean, a very serious attempt or several serious attempts to draw lessons from this, this investment and this engagement have been, have been uh, done. So, uh, and essentially it comes down to uh, what did the international community do right? What could it have done differently? And what should it maybe be doing differently? Both, of course, in Afghanistan as we go ahead and go along, uh, and obviously also in other uh, contexts. So, um, Ms. Cardell, as, as a representative of the, uh, of, of, of the United Nations in, in the country, uh, what, 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 do you, what do you see? How do you see these uh, lessons? Uh, how, how are they, what are the key lessons and how are they taken into account? And, and if you want to allude to what was said on the peace process, you may, of mm -hmm. course, as well. Mm -hmm. So please, and then I'll ask you, Ambassador Sherberg. Yeah. No, thank you very much. And I think, uh, I think, I mean, the, the, the key lessons learned that, that I would like to talk about fits very well into, in, into the picture of, of what are the challenges in the peace process. And I think one of the first key lessons learned is a little bit, um, it, it is easy to say, but it is, and, and it's said very often, but it's very hard to internalize. And that is the whole concept of, of being Afghan owned and Afghan led. And I think that has been a very hard lesson to learn for the international community and for that sake also for the Afghan people and the Afghan government because it means something for, for both sides. Um, and I very much believe that, that what you were talking about, uh, Professor, is also something that at the end of the day it, it, that process has to be led by Afghanistan and has then to be supported by others, but it has to be supported. It has to be led by, by a strong, coherent desire for peace by the Afghan people, led by the Afghan government. But one of the things that, that, that is in it then is, what, it, what does that not mean? It does not mean that the international community disengages or that the international community kind of just lets things float. It means a very strong but a different voice by the international community. There is a very strong dependency between the, the Afghan government and the Afghan people and the international community. <coughs> and I think, I don't know, but, but for the, as a newcomer coming to it, it looks like there is a process going on of reshaping that relationship that is about bringing the responsibility for a whole lot of things back in the hands of the Afghan government. And that means that the international community has to be, be uh, withdrawing a little bit in its being up on stage and being actually a key actor in the game um, on the Afghan scene. Um, and at the same time, I think, and certainly also being from, from the UN, standing on principle, standing on the normative agenda, standing on, on, on some of the things that, that would have to be a part of, 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 of the conversation. I mean, we just, um, th there was just a big, a big conference in, in Brussels with all the money that was again being recommitted to Afghanistan and lots of mutual uh, commitments being made. It is really essential that there is a process and a dynamics around an ongoing conversation about this. I think we all know that commitments are difficult to implement, but let's not use that as a, as a sleeping pill, but you, uh, rather as a platform for a very strong discussion and engagement on what does it actually take to move these issues forward, whether it's on the peace process, whether it's on de building democratic institutions, elections, whether it's anti-corruption, et cetera, et cetera. It is important to keep the discussion going. So the international community is there as a partner, but, but really taking the lead from, from, uh, from the Afghan uh, government and the Afghan people. The second thing I think is important also to look at right now, and that's not least also in light of what uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister was talking about with the encouraging outreach towards peace. 
Um, and whether it's a lesson learned or whether it's a reflection, we can, di we can certainly discuss. But there is an important reflection on whether or not peace is something, a peace process is something that would eventually be dealt with between fighting parties and to what extent it's possible to get a more inclusive process uh, going where both women and young people are involved um, in, in the peace process. And I think there's, there's, we can get back to that when we talk mm. about, the, about the future. Mm. But the inclusivity of the peace process is important while at the same time recognizing that when you start talks about talks about talks, everybody cannot be around the table. But, but, but to be sure that the design is such that it, is, that, that, that it leads to something where, 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 where the Afghan people can also feel encouraged by, by the potential outcome of, of these peace processes. And then I think the third lesson learned is what we have been talking a lot about, and that's the regional dynam right. di dimension that cannot be overemphasized and, and how to handle it is something that, uh, that, that is a long discussion, so thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Cardell. Uh, Ambassador Sjöberg, uh, I mean, we, when I refer to, to studies, uh, it's actually several Nordic studies. We've got uh, a Danish and a Norwegian that were released already this year, and a Swedish one is, is forthcoming. Mm -hmm. How do you see these uh, lessons uh, for the international community, maybe for small countries like the Scandinavian ones, and, and uh, how do you like to yeah. to reply to this or, mm. or respond to this? Uh, the Swedish study or evaluation will now be ready on the 28th of uh, February next year. Okay. So it has been extended a little bit, but uh, of course we are very much looking forward to to see what the, what the conclusions will be. But uh, as you said, we have seen from Norway, from Denmark. We had a big lessons learned conference in Washington early this this year, w which where yeah. I had the opportunity to participate. And one of the lessons observed uh, from that exercise was we looked a lot, lot at, uh, <coughs> at 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 the differences between the the goals from the security sector, from the military sector, and from the from the development sector. And uh, it, it became very obvious in in that discussion that uh, the security sector, the military, has uh, often short-term goals which are very precise and exact and they want to secure an area or they want to create stability or th those kind of things but when you talk about development you often look at you know things like state building institution building um, uh, projects and programs that may take ages to to achieve so that I think that's one of the lessons uh, observed how, how do you how do you engage in a uh, in a, 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 a huge uh, reconstruction exercise like this, where you have perhaps not conflicting goals, but goals that are not, uh, you know, f perfectly fit with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, the other lesson th uh, that often comes up is uh, about coordination, uh, and uh, Pernille was alluding to that uh, coordination between the government and the perspectives, objectives of the government, uh, what they want to achieve, and what do we as donors achieve and of course uh, we had a system with uh, provincial reconstruction teams for uh, almost 10 years and those were very much guided by the objectives set up by the partner countries that were uh, s uh, you know supporting and in charge mm -hmm. of these PRTs mm -hmm. so so conflicting goals again uh, uh, between uh, government and <coughs> what donors might want to achieve in the, in the PRT. So, but we ha what we have seen since, at least since uh, 2009, 2010, is that these goals are now coming together. Uh, there are uh, very good plans that have been <coughs> developed and that are led by the Afghan government. And we see our role here as donors to both to coordinate our support and also to support the government, of course, in their, in their endeavors. So donor coordination and coordination with the government in terms of plans, visions, and, and, and program is, 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 is key here. And we have the big uh, World Bank Fund, the ARTF, Afghan Reconstruction Trust Fund, which I believe is the biggest uh, trust fund in the world, uh, which is uh, one of the key instruments. And then, of course, we have other uh, types of donor coordination um, uh, organizations or groups. So you would say that um, lessons are learned and they mm. are applied and the engagement 
remains by the international community here? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very encouraged that we have been able to open up this mm. window for another four years. And mm. uh, uh, the international co uh, community has been uh, extraordinarily supportive here, uh, both in the uh, NATO conference in Warsaw and, and also in Brussels. So we are actually buying another four years. We are investing another four years to to make uh, the country sustainable and make the country uh, come over this this uh, this current hurdle so i think this is this is really key yeah even though i think four years in terms of peace building for a country with the Absolutely. type of conflict that we've mm. seen is is still a short mm. very short period mr Kasai, you wanted to to reflect just on, <coughs> on <coughs> just very briefly i think the, the this is a lesson that I think uh, we keep learning over and over, uh, quite sadly, uh, is that it's really about empowering local population. It's about mm. letting the locals do what's right. It's about, you know, that very grand saying about letting the locals uh, learn how to fish, not just feeding them. You know, it's about that. And I think whenever those kind of activities have taken place in terms of development work, we've been successful. So today, I think if you look at uh, for example, the education sector, uh, there's enormous amount of progress. Yeah. If you look at, for example, the healthcare uh, sector in terms of child mortality, in terms of, you know, for example, you know, uh, uh, being accessible uh, healthcare provider and things like that. And particularly, I think if you look at the media, we have some of the most spontaneous and quite vibrant media mm. out there, you know, like over 30 different televisions and stations, mm -hmm. printed media and things like that. So in terms of development, I think you see enormous amount of, enormous amount of, of progress. I think where we got it wrong, uh, and, and it's something that I think needed to, to have, you know, we should have looked at the politics uh, from, from different angles, particularly mm -hmm. if you look, looked at the region, particularly looking at, you know, I, I talked about the fact that when there is an insurgency that has a safe sanctuary, the chance of that insurgency uh, moving towards success are much greater. Mm. You know, for over a decade, we completely ignored that. So that, that is something that I think we, we needed to recalculate and, and see how we can focus on that. Thank you. Well, you have the privilege of having been a scholar for many years on yeah. Afghanistan, and yeah. now uh, you're in a position to influence uh, things. So. <laughs> So good to hear that you, you consider that the, the lessons are being, uh, being applied. Um, Dr. Rubin and, and, and also to Richard, uh, moving slowly towards uh, opportunities here, uh, but maybe also if you would like to comment on, on, on some of the aspects of what have been said here on, on, on lessons. Um, what, what do you see, if I start with you, uh, Dr. Rubin, as the, the current main both domestic and, and foreign uh, factors that work uh, in a conducive way towards uh, peace and security for, for, uh, for Afghanistan, if we turn it around or uh, start I, slowly to do so. Yeah, well, <laughs> before answering that question, I'll just say w one thing, which is people need relative uh, certainty about the future. I won't say confidence, because even if it's certainty about something bad, they need some kind of the clarity about what the future will bring in order to plan. And right now, they don't have that. Okay, and we'll have to wait some time for that. I think the most uh, positive thing that has been happening in Afghanistan in the region, as I mentioned earlier, is the very rapid development of the, exactly the type of infrastructure that Afghanistan will need uh, to uh, break out of the, uh, of, it, of the backwardness that is caused by being landlocked. Um, I think, in a way, the, the big program that, uh, the breakthrough program was uh, China's program, which they now call One Belt, One Road, which has multiple facets, uh, including the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, which uh, I think, uh, Afg and Afghanistan has already signed a protocol with China about Afghanistan uh, joining the, the set of projects, including potentially uh, the, the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. In response, India, perhaps not entirely response, India and Iran are collaborating 
uh, on a route through the port of Chabahar so that India will have direct access to Afghanistan and also to uh, Central Asia to be determined whether that uh, leads to cooperation and peace or to a new type of conflict. Um, you have the, uh, an agreement by Afghanistan with Turkmenistan and some other countries uh, to open what is called the Lapis Lazuli route from Afghanistan through Turkmenistan and then Caspian Sea and the Caucasus to Europe, which would be the first uh, international route from Afghanistan that does not depend on either Pakistan, Iran, or Russia. <laughs> So strategically, uh, could be very important. And just recently, the first railroad was inaugurated there. Um, uh, um, Shangxi, that was, was which province? I forget which province. Shangxi, I think, province in Easter, eastern China, recently sent uh, at least one train uh, all across Central Asia to Mazar Sharif with commercial goods. Iran also sent a train to uh, Herat from Tehran. Other railroads, uh, which Afghanistan has never had, are also being built. So these are these means that the environment around Afghanistan is completely different from what it was after the Soviet withdrawal in 1989. In particular, because uh, there's a huge amount of investment and there are potentially huge losses to all of these major countries mm -hmm. if they cannot stabilize the situation. So I think for the first time in decades, they have really a, a serious self-interest in trying to find a way to do it, which may make them more willing to take risks. Thank you. That's very, that's encouraging. We're starting to move toward it. But, uh, <laughs> Richard, uh, how do you see uh, these more conducive factors, if mm. I may? Well, I see uh, definitely see a couple of positive notes as well. At the domestic level, I would argue that um, there are definitely a number of very hardworking, very committed officials who work relentlessly towards achieving peace and stability. So those individuals in the government are absolutely there. The Afghan forces, as has been mentioned before, in a largely independent capacity, continue to battle under very different, or sorry, very difficult circumstances. And it should also be noted that the country has a youth bulge of roughly 65%, so say the, the muscle to reconstruct the country and the physical brain to reconstruct the country, that is an asset and that's there. Um, at the foreign level, Indeed, there are these integration efforts going on, mostly led by, by, by China, to an extent by, by India, Iran. These are all very positive. They could potentially change the mindset, move it somewhat away from geopolitics and very zero-sum foreign policies to something that moves more towards geoeconomics, uh, somewhat more perceptive to integration positive development, but I think the, the harvest of this is most likely going to be over the, the long term. Mm -hmm. um, the international community remains committed. Indeed, there are other priorities now. Afghanistan is not anymore in, say, the top five. It definitely moved a few notches down, but the commitment is there. Sweden, Europe, yeah. US possibly, other major Let's donors. So this is something that should be strategically tapped. And on a final note, there is quite a unique momentum going on in terms of, say, the alignment of, of relevant powers. That is to say that some of the key actors, the US, EU, China, Russia, India, um, their interest to see a stable Afghanistan is is largely overlapping. This wasn't always the case in Afghan history. And there are, among some of these actors, certain notions of, say, strategic distrust. But I would say that it is largely a positive development that should be tapped strategically and intelligently. Despite what Dr. Rubin said a while ago about the conflicting interests, and no one can agree. But, but if I may uh, come back to you, Mr. Karsai, uh, on this, uh, on the chances for a, a virtuous uh, cycle, but also your assessment of the political and the and the security landscape. If we start slowly to wrap uh, the discussion up here, uh, but what's what's sure. your take on sure. these issues? Before before I get to that, uh, I, I want to uh, comment on something Barney and both Richard have said. 
politically, I think for the past decade or so, we have seen a zero-sum game mm. uh, because the progress one made or the achievement one made was sort of uh, seen in a negative perspective. Mm. Uh, if you had relationship with one country, uh, you know, the other country saw it in a negative light because, you know, you were getting closer to that. Mm. I think both uh, Barney and I have a friend which has coined this term that Afghanistan is not just a conflict within itself, it's a theme park of conflict. <laughs> <laughs> a theme park of conflict because you have... I mean, Ali Jalali. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you know? So you have, for example, uh, you know, these various different elements battling it out. So how can we change that equation? And I think the best way to put it is, as Barney said, we need to start looking at this economic e equation. Mm. Mm. This region is enormously rich, uh, whether it's minerals, whether it's energy, whether it's infrastructure, and it's developing that infrastructure. Mm. You know, the, the <coughs> port of Chabahar gives Afghanistan access not to be landlocked lo lock anymore. Uh, the rail line with Turkmenistan or this rail line all the way to China, this gives Afghanistan this mentality that it will not be dependent on Pakistan, on Gwadar or Karachi for the rest of its years. Mm. That is the first mentality that, that I think the regional <coughs> players need to look, that this region is moving economically. So you either adjust yourself yeah. or you are left behind in this context. Particularly, I think the, the, the demands that you sort of see. Central Asia is very rich, uh, whether it's with energy or whether it's with, with, with uh, uh, specifically uh, gas, electricity. These are things that South Asia is absolutely looking at. So for example, there's a very serious uh, need for whether it's gas or through TAPI pipeline, that it goes from Turkmenistan to Afghanistan to Pakistan, going all the way to India, or whether it's electri electricity uh, mm -hmm. that is in the form of Casa 1000 and various other projects that is going towards mm -hmm. South Asia. So Central Asia uh, providing the necessary uh, needs uh, that uh, South Asia desires. And Afghanistan really, and this is what the ultimate goal for Afghanistan is, to be, to be this connector, to be this bridge. If you look at the history of Afghanistan, it has always been, whether it was part of the Silk Route or now part of being this one belt, uh, one road element, is to provide this roundabout. Mm -hmm. And this is the objective that, that we wanted to, to move towards. Uh, and in the last two years, I think we have seen enormous amount of mm -hmm. progress in this regard. And you uh, see that the government will organize itself to create the framework that will be conducive to that these chances and uh, opportunities are well taken care no, of? No, no, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. in, in two areas, look, in order for us to become this land bridge mm -hmm. uh, or to become, you know, this, this roundabout, we have to have both the software and the hardware. The hardware is really the rails, the roads, and the infrastructure. The software is really agreements between these various countries, whether it's through custom agreements, trade agreements, through various different levels, and we are absolutely committed to that. The problem is, is that South Asia and Central Asia is the least connected region. Mm. But at least this is what we're pushing for, this is what we're moving in that direction. Thank you. Ms. Cornell, what's your, uh, if you look into the crystal ball here, if you, how do you see the political situation or the political landscape moving along and, and do you see any chances for opportunities as we mm. go along? Well, I, I certainly think there are some very important opportunities coming up. Mm. Um, and I think one of them that has just kind of been opened up is the opportunity of rebuilding trust in the democratic institution with the putting in place of new uh, electoral commissions um, that has been so important. But that in and of itself is of course not enough and there are some key, key challenges in, in, in actually uh, rebuilding that trust in, in democratic institutions. And I think it's, there's, there's a, there is a, a really a strategic choice by Afghanistan right now to say, is this an opportunity that should lead to rebuilding that trust? Or is this an opportunity that would be more put into the political uh, maneuvering mm -hmm. and then get out of it whatever comes out of it? And I think it's, I, from, from, from our perspective, <coughs> of course, it's essential that, that it is the first choice rather than the latter. And there's some really d difficulties in it because, of course, I mean, parliament has already said for a year longer than its mandate. Uh, this, so, so there is a desire to see uh, new elections for, for the parliament. At the same time, it's important that these elections are, are being prepared properly. 
And I think there is also a discussion to be had in Afghanistan and among the political elite. What kind of role would I like to play as a politician? Am I one of those who would like to cheat my way to power? I'm one of those who would like to bring, uh, build strong democratic institutions that rest on a, on a mandate, a solid mandate from the population. Um, and, and, you know, we are, of course, with the Afghan government working very much on, on supporting the electoral reforms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they can do so much, and they are very essential to get off the ground. But there is a choice to be made as yeah. to whether it is the rebuilding of trust in the institutions of, of, of whether it's a different game that's important. And it would also be important for leading up to the 2019 presidential election, whether there are some shifts in that type of culture. And there I also see that you know, the government has started some very encouraging work on anti-corruption, and that would be essential to see that being carried through to something that is meaningful, meaningful in the bigger picture, but also meaningful for the, for the Afghan people out in their daily lives, dealing with it. With, there was a report coming from CIPRI recently about what women see as the biggest obstacle for getting involved in, in the, in, in, as a political player and as a meaningful for participant. Yeah. And the first issue that was raised there was corruption. Yeah. So, so, you know, there's some, there's some opportunities there, but they have to be harvested properly in order to, in order to lead to, to uh, in the right direction. And the second thing that where I think there's also some really uh, good opportunities, uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister Kasai was talking about it, the, the first steps towards in, to, into the field of the peace process that is, that is really, really encouraging to say that that's a part of the conversation now. It wasn't a part of the conversation uh, just a few months ago, but the, but the agreement with, with, with Hizbi Islami has all of a sudden brought that back. And that has also brought back a conversation about a, li a tiny little space of the discussion of transitional justice. That is, if anything, an area when we talk about Afghan-led and Afghan-owned, that is where the international community has to be desperately careful. This is not our conversation. This is the Afghan conversation. And if we get it wrong, we would hamper uh, the, the conversation that Afghanistan would need with itself in order to settle the past and, and with the prospect for the future. But I do see that there is a space now for the conversation about transitional justice that is just growing very little, but I think it's important to grasp that and get that right in order to be sure that the, that, the, that the great work on peace processes that may come in 2017, if we are lucky and if only things play out well, actually leads to, to the Afghan people being, being, uh, being encouraged by and feeling that the prospect for their life is something that, that, that is, is encouraging and, and takes into account their sufferings over the many, many, many years. So, um, and then, of course, the last thing that I would mention again is where we started out is, is for the government to deliver, to, 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 to continue a steady force on, 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 uh, on getting the government to, to, together and to deliver on, on its promises to its people. Thank you so much. Ambassador Schoberg, do you, do you share this yeah, very positive much. Uh, uh, yeah. assessment and chance? And uh, maybe if you also kind of turn it a little bit towards the security situation, after all, uh, with the magnificent challenges that we talked about earlier. Mm, mm. What, what, what I see, and I, I want to come back to that, that's, uh, that there is a government in place with, uh, with uh, uh, a range of very uh, committed and highly professional people that have started to address uh, many of these fields that we have discussed. The economy, there, there are a lot of things going in in, in the area of connectivity, building these r railways and, and dams and so forth. So that is slowly, slowly uh, taking pace. Uh, secondly, on the, on the peace process, uh, as, as the minister mentioned, on the huge political risks reaching out both to, uh, to neighboring countries, but also to, to Hezb Islami. And these are open up new doors for, for new people to, that might want to come to the table or at least start talks about talks, how this could be you know, uh, a model for, 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 uh, for the future. So these are a couple of things that I wanted to highlight. Then what Pernille said on, on elections, I think you could, uh, you could easily see that this could be another opportunity that it could engage more with with insurgency because i mean we all agree that this is uh, you know we can never no one can ever win this war so it's a matter of winning winning the peace and how should you win the peace well it should be through the ballot boxes uh, so 
the insurgents, the people that are engaged in, in violent activities, they should be invited and uh, encouraged to come to, to, to join the, the election process. And again, the government has paved the way with, uh, with these uh, committees, commissions now in place, so that they can start uh, in close collaboration with the UN and the international community, start to plan for, for the next election. So I, th there are a range of opportunities uh, that, that I see coming up, mm. coming up here. Thank you. We'll soon open up for, for, for questions here from yourselves out in the audience here. But, but before that, a couple of uh, last words, maybe, you, uh, Dr. Rubin, on, on how you see the security situation. Do you share this, uh, these assessments here of, 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 of chances and positive outlook? And maybe to you, Richard, a couple of words about the, the prospects for the economy uh, in just uh, couple of brief words, and as I said, then we open up. Well, I very much share Hickman's assessment of the security situation in that if the withdrawal of 150,000 NATO troops did not lead to a change in the security situation, we might wonder what is the purpose of NATO. Uh, <laughs> and it, I, it is remarkable that despite such a huge troop withdrawal, the security situation has not changed suddenly, dramatically, uh, in any <coughs> particular way, and the institutions are working. Of course, they're facing a lot of a lot of challenges, but um, as long as they continue to receive financial and political support from outside, um, they will they will hold on and create the conditions for a political agreement. They won't create the conditions for victory, but they will create the conditions for a political agreement. And also, uh, you know, those security forces are important in another way, in that the only way that you can have non-military politics in a country is if you have security forces that are, do not belong to any political faction. And that is what Afghanistan did not have for decades. Until, and that is why, you know, when the Taliban took over Kabul, they didn't take over the army. They replaced the existing army with their army and so mm. on with everybody mm. else. So mm. Now there's an army. So it's important not just for the war, but for the peace process that the security institutions be strengthened. Thank you. A couple of words from you, Richard. Uh, for the economy, I think the, uh, over the short to medium term, um, the formal sector, rather dismal outlook. Informal will continue as is, largely self-sustained. Illicit will continue to thrive. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we've already tapped into the time that we wanted to use for questions and, and answers. But I'd like to, to open it up to anyone in the audience. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, please introduce yourself briefly if you would like to contribute. Yeah, we have one question down here and then here. Uh, hello. Sir. Yeah, Martin Botts from Karolinska. Thanks to the panelists. Um, Mr. Kazai, you mentioned um, the empowerment of the local level, like stating also some social um, development goals like education, child mortality. Um, I would like to know if you could give us some examples or strategies how this um, empowerment of the local level could be achieved in Afghanistan. Sure. Take the other one or this one? Um, it's up to you. We can take another one. Well, we could we could take Mr. Landmarker here as well, the former chair of CIPRI. Thank you, Jorah Landmarker, former chair of, of CIPRI. I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, about the conflict. It's also a conflict of values. And what I heard in the meeting, particularly with women in Afghanistan, was that they were afraid of a peace among men that would be paid by women. I mean, selling out the rights of women to, to schools, etc. What is your comment on that? Or did, did the, the agreement with, with uh, Hekmatyar, did that not infringe on the achieved principles, for example, for women? Number two is, uh, if I see in the international uh, statistics, it seems as Afghanistan is moving rapidly up when it comes to social indicators, life expectancy, uh, Etc. Could you comment on that? Because I think this is really important. If you see a real, real progress on the living conditions among people. Thank you. Thank you, Yaron. <coughs> and shall we maybe also take the last question in this first round, please? Hello, my name is Saga Holmgren, and I represent an organization called Operation 1325. 
So we work with the involvement of women in peace processes. And I was very interested to hear, Mrs. Cardell, your comment on the uh, inclusivity of, of these talks that might possibly become a peace process. And I was very curious to hear Mr. Karzai's comment on that. Sure. Thank you so much. Shall we maybe start with sure. the uh, sure. health sure. Uh, question and then move on on the uh, values, etc. But please. The first question that was asked about empowering at local level. We have uh, excellent examples uh, of how uh, empowerment has taken place uh, <coughs> through development. And I think uh, several of us who have been involved in Afghanistan know that. There's a particular project, uh, and I urge you to, to do some research on it. It's called NSP, National Solidarity Program. This is one of the most remarkable, pro remarkable programs because it was designed quite earlier. Uh, almost 2002 and three. Uh, it empowers at the people at the village level. Uh, what it does is it gives a block grant to a particular village. And then it asks the village uh, that in order for you to spend this grant, you need to come together in a consensus format and decide what is it that the village want. Whether it's a school, whether it's a, a, a well or, or a madrasa, whatever it may be. I mean, we've had development projects which uh, have been quite disastrous. You know, we've had roads that ended up, you know, going towards a mountain uh, where there was nothing there. We have had uh, schools <coughs> which were the nearest village was over two or three kilometers away. Yeah. So whenever you have had these kind of projects where the local population was empowered, uh, you really have a very positive outcome in many of these areas. And there are a lot of needs that the people will tell you about saying, you know, here's what we want. And there was an example that we looked at uh, that there was at one point uh, enormous amount of schools that were being burned. And we started to count and went up to several dozens that were burned. You know, out of all the schools that we looked at, not even one single of them uh, was, were the schools that were built by NSP because it was the local people who decided to spend this, monitor the construction of it, and then at the end when somebody wanted to burn, they would say, look, this is our own. Uh, how can you burn this? You know, and it's about local ownership. So whenever there's no local ownership, it's very difficult to, to move forward on that. On values, uh, the chairman's question, uh, and particularly, uh, I was the lead negotiator for the government uh, on the first face-to-face -face dialogue uh, with the Taliban. I was also the negotiator for the QCG, Quadrilateral Coordination Group, uh, and in many of these discussions. And uh, I've always made the point that we have to have women representation, uh, not just women sort of a token representation. We have to have women, and, and, and I think in the past 20 uh, or 30 years, one of the things that has happened is that we have some enormously credible uh, and reputed women uh, who have been part of the civil society. You know? So on, on our, after our first talks, we immediately decided that we have to have women in various of these formats. And even now, if you look at our High Peace Council, uh, one of the deputy directors uh, of the High Peace Council is a woman who's here uh, now in, in uh, Stockholm. We'll be talking to the Women's Mediation Network tomorrow uh, to, to discuss this. I think in all of my conversations, in all of the areas where I've led the government delegation, there are certain things that I say that, you know, we may be able to negotiate on a few things, we may be able to ne not negotiate on, on others. One of the things that we can absolutely not negotiate on is the rights of human beings. The rights, and particularly, we cannot compromise on the right of anyone uh, in this context. So we take uh, the right of women and particularly the right of human beings extremely seriously and this is something that is one of the greatest achievements of the past 15 years and we cannot take that for li uh, you know uh, lightly and anything that doesn't take us forward takes us back is not something that the Afghan people are going to agree to so that is value that we're going to proceed in this regard similarly I think uh, in this context you know about social indicators it's about you know, a slow delivery from the government and particularly I would go give credit to the enormously energetic uh, NGO community that exists in Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, they're probably some of the most remarkable people. And I, here I give also example of, of you know, uh, the Swedish Committee for Afghanistan. It has done enormous amount of work. I mean, if you look at Mazar, if you look at some of these other provinces, I mean, they have delivered health, they have delivered on, 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 on education, but there are Afghans that have been trained along the way. And it's services that are not just being uh, delivered by the government, it's coming from a lot of these local organizations and international organizations. And, 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 and if one area that I said we have done well is, it's being able to provide certain level of, of delivery uh, to the local population. On 1325, uh, we have been quite instrumental in, in uh, moving forward with 1325. We've had already a drafting session, a launching session. We have already finalized the budget for 1325. Uh, I have been personally instrumental in making sure that, that it is absolutely implemented and we streamline uh, the, 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 the gender uh, element of that. We have allocated about $50 million. Uh, there's about $11 million that the Afghan government would directly uh, provide, and then there's about 38 uh, points uh, so uh, million dollars that uh, our international partners will provide to start looking at different projects, to start assessing. And in here, I, I absolutely uh, compliment the role that, that Sweden has played, particularly because this is one of the key cross-cutting themes that has undertaken, and, and we have had enormous amount of progress here. Thank you, Mr. Kassai. Would anyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, Ambassador Sherbang. Just, yeah. just very quickly on yeah. the 1325. I could also share with you that together with the government, with the minister and uh, the Ministry for Women Affairs, uh, we're organizing trainings, uh, training uh, in mediation mm -hmm. for women from the, from the provinces. Uh, and it, that's together with the Folke Bernadotte Academy. But it's, uh, again, it's Afghan-led. It's with Afghan trainers in, in Dari and Pashto. And it, uh, th the beneficiaries here are, are women from the provinces where, which rarely come to Kabul. Uh, so they come there for training, but also to network with other women in, in similar situation. It's, it's a small contribution, but I mean, we, we are also there to, to, to try to play an active role as, as an embassy. Sounds like a great contribution. Uh, Ms. Cardell, you wanted to, and also Dr. Barnett? Yeah, let me just, uh, just come with a, with a, a quick comment uh, on that maybe. Um, and, and just to make us not necessarily fully agree on everything that we say in the panel. <laughs> um, I think, you know, th there's no question about that so much has been achieved for women in Afghanistan over the last 15 years. It's also, as you say, there is a value agenda in this and there are some choices that are being made and that has to be made and some really difficult uh, issues coming up and they come up in the connection, obviously, with, with some of the peace negotiations that are being, that, that are being explored. The question is just where the time has come for Afghanistan and for its international partners to start not talking about what has been achieved over 15 years, but what needs to be achieved over the next four or five uh, years. And I say that because I think while there has been so much achieved, we cannot continue to live with that, I think. I think there needs to be a, a more ambitious agenda on this. There's just been elections to the uh, provincial council uh, administrative boards and fewer women have been elected to the administrative boards positions this year than last year. It's marginally, but it is there. Um, it, and, it, and the question is not, if you actually look at it, are we, t are we looking at a, at a curve that is, that's plateauing out? Which is fine, because there's so much investment in this and achievement. But do we dare to try to be ambitious, ambitious and say that the agenda for the next few years, and was actually <coughs> also to some extent identified in the Afghan uh, Peace and Development Framework that was a, a base document for the Brussels conference, is to say, okay, let's, let's ensure that women are actually actively involved, as the Deputy Foreign Minister said, in the peace processes, not just on gender issues, but as contributors on the broader issues. Let's make sure that women get meaningfully involved as political players and political actors, and, and there are, as opposed to 15 years ago, the number of young, well-educated women who are out there and ready is numerous. They are there and they are ready, uh, as well as they have, have older mm -hmm. sisters, doc, just like Dr. Sarabi, uh, 
who can who can take the lead on some of this, and and thirdly also to look at the commitment that was made uh, in Brussels by the president on em on economic empowerment of women. Let's try to uh, let's try to develop a forward-looking, more ambitious agenda rather than resting on what has been achieved for the last 15 years. While of course at the same time continue to celebrate the things have changed. Uh, thanks a lot for that comment, Dr. Rubin. You wanted to add uh, briefly. I have heard this anxiety a great deal about that peace might be bad for women, but I would like to say as a general principle, peace is good for women, war is bad for women. And, I, I, it, and it is unfortunate if the rights of women is used as a justification for continuing killing and bloodshed. It should not be. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as dealing with the Taliban and Hikmatyar, I've been monitoring along with Hikmat all many of the discussions that have taken place with the Taliban by various parties. The Taliban do not say that they're fighting to overcome the social, to destroy the social gains of Afghanistan. In fact, they never mention it. You know, when the, the Taliban were not organized as a movement against democracy and women's rights, that's not what you would see in Afghanistan in 1994. They were organized as a, as a movement against civil war and anarchy, and they used very harsh methods for it. Now the situation is different. Um, they have a different narrative about why they are fighting. Uh, I, I, you know, and I think in the, Hiz in the Hizbi Islami negotiations, as far as I know, that wasn't even a subject. Oh, no, no. Absolutely. well, it didn't even, it did not even come up, and it's never come up in any of the discussions with the Taliban either, because it's uh, except in the se except in a positive way. Uh, so I think there are plenty of things to worry about, and in fact, women's rights are at risk in Afghanistan. They're at risk today, as she was saying, and as as the international involvement decreases, they will be more and more at risk. But the risk to them will not come from peace. But maybe from very conservative traditions. Mm. That are and from the ability to, to finance, uh, the inability to finance the programs that women are benefiting from. Mm. Remember, mm. all of these social gains are not economically sustainable. Mm. Yeah, uh, we're already more or less on overtime here. But if we have one final or one or two final <coughs> questions, and then we'll wrap it up, because I think I owe you that. So please, uh, we have one question here, and then one, and then a third, and then we draw a line after that. If. Uh, hello, my name is Inayatul Adil. I'm doing my internship at SIDA, but my questions are, are not on behalf of SIDA, my own questions. Uh, you, Mr. Sherberry, mentioned that there's lack of trust among regional players. But I will mention that also there's enormous lack of trust among Afghans, among Afghans on uh, state institutions and the government. And that is due to uh, lack of delivery, basic services, and uh, enormous corruption in the country. So my questions to Mr. Hikmat Karzai is, how do you deal with these uh, political corruption and the administrative corruption uh, because the corruption also, you know, contribute to the insurgency. So, so, yeah. Thank you. That's very clear. We had a question down here, I believe. Yeah. Thank you for the very interesting uh, talk we had this morning. I am an intern at the Institute for Security and Development Policy. Um, my question um, rather regards um, the relationship uh, between uh, Sweden and Afghanistan. And I would like to hear from you what you think about the agreement uh, that provides for the return of illegal migrants um, to Afghanistan, also considering that Sweden is one of the major donors. And I would like how I would like to hear how you see this uh, act. What is the political meaning? Thank, Thank you. you. That's very clear. Please, the last question. Yeah, my name is Sirajuddin Khalid. I work for uh, Fort Benedict <coughs> Academy as a researcher. Uh, my question is also regarding the negotiations. Uh, I've been working a little bit with this issue since a uh, few years. Um, if you look back in 2010, 11, 12, <clears throat> there has been too many actors active playing in this. I mean, to, for instance, there has been in, uh, times that more than two dozen of uh, <coughs> actors has been involved in this uh, so-called talks about talks. <clears throat> so I would like to ask a question that uh, what is the situation now? Uh, how coordinated <coughs> the efforts uh, are now? And um, as you mentioned about this, um, uh, we, we really 
don't hear about the contents of the discussions, what are actually on the table. Uh, as uh, uh, Barnt mentioned, the issue of uh, women that has never come on the table. <clears throat> Similarly, we uh, always hear about uh, one of the major conditions from Taliban that uh, they want to discuss uh, the uh, constitution of Afghanistan. Has ever, I mean, really, they have been asking about you know amendments or you know anything. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess that, uh, Mr. Kasai, you'll have to respond to all of the three of these, and then I'll ask for brief comments from uh, you two others here. So, on the lack of delivery and political and ministry of corruption, yeah. on the agreement with Sweden, and on what's the content of the talks sure. right now. First, we know, last question. <clears throat> How do we... I completely agree. I think there is, uh, you know, a certain level of distrust with the government which has to do, obviously, with, with corruption, and uh, both at the political level and at the administrative level. But at the administrative level, uh, the only way we can really deal with corruption is by fixing our procedures and processes. That is the best way we, we can do, and, and there are elements, and there are discussions going on on how to streamline these processes, where the interactions uh, with the government officials are reduced. Uh, if you look at, for example, various different processes in Afghanistan, uh, just like most uh, bureaucracies in developing countries, there's enormous amount of steps to almost everything. You know, at one point we calculated that in order to get a license, uh, you needed to go through like 52 processes. Mm. That on each level was, was a disaster. So administrative uh, corruption really has, is about procedure, it's about streamlining things. Political corruption uh, on many levels, it, it's about there has to be a deterrent factor. And there has been uh, several deterrent factors in the sense that uh, people have to be held accountable. Uh, we've had very senior people now being held accountable. We recently had a, a, a major general uh, who mm. was brought in by the major crime task force uh, and was punished and now he's in prison. And, and the ambassador can tell you more details on that. And I think. Uh, one of the, the key elements uh, for us to have an engagement with our international partners, one of the key issues for us is to be able to deliver, for us to not really keep asking for more assistance, but it's really about us delivering, us making sure that we mm. stand on our feet. Mm. And, and corruption is something, obviously, that at the end of the day, uh, not something that we are going to tolerate. On the issue of refugees, Afghan migrant returning, um, we have a bilateral agreement uh, and we also have a, a, a document with the EU called the Joint Way Forward. Uh, Afghanistan as a responsible uh, player uh, is going to abide by that agreement. It is going to make sure that uh, the commitment that we have made to our partners is, is abided by and at the same time we're able to deliver on what is expected of us. Once uh, people are able to go through their necessary due process, uh, and if the host country decides to send these individuals, then we will absolutely take them. Uh, but on a different note, I mean, the past couple of months, we have had 500,000 <coughs> Afghans return from Pakistan. Mm. You know, this is enormous amount of numbers, and these are numbers that we're now trying to accommodate. So one of the things that we are reaching out to our partner is that, that while we're happy to accept these people, we need to make sure that once these people arrive, that they have a livelihood, that they are programs such as vocational training, you know, various different uh, schemes where they can be engaged and involved. Uh, so that's where we seek support. Uh, Sarajuddin Saheb is, is asking me to give him my speech for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I'm speaking in the Women's Mediation Network tomorrow, and I think some of these questions are, are going to be things that I'll talk about. But particularly, you know, uh, at this stage we are with the Taliban. Uh, with the Hizb Islami, I think we made enormous amount of progress, and we have an agreement. There's a commission that is, uh, which I'm part of, uh, to implement a lot of the, the decisions that were made. Uh, there are various committees that have been formed. For example, there's a committee on on detainees. Uh, there's a committee on delisting. There's a committee on refugees. There's a committee on uh, military uh, affairs. So all of these committees have particular individuals uh, that are following 
there's an element from Hizb Islami, there's an element from the government and HPC together. They're following on these issues. So, so there is delivery. For us, we need to make sure we absolutely deliver on the Hizb Islami deal because the Taliban and various other elements are watching to see whether we can deliver or not. If we're not able to deliver with Hizb Islami, the deal with the Taliban is going to be much more complicated. And with Taliban, I think at, at this stage, we're still at confidence building measures. And there are issues that they have asked us. Uh, in the past, as you know, that there were elements about delisting some of the senior Taliban members and also giving them an address. You know, and, and, and one of the additional requests that they used to have is that, you know, uh, bringing many of their people that were in Guantanamo, uh, either to Qatar or back to Afghanistan, uh, five of those very famous detainees, the famous five, have already come back to Guant uh, from Guantanamo to, to, uh, to Doha. But there are elements that we are now directly working with them. I think the United States and, and Afghanistan, we are trying very much to see how we can start this process. And I think we're going to have more engagement during the winter time. Uh, so we're optimistic about that. Thank you. Any other oh. final comments? Yeah. Just, one, just really I want to yeah. emphasize what Hikmat just said. All the discussions that I have been aware of with the Taliban have been either about confidence building measures or about procedures. Yeah. There's been no discussion about substance of resolving yeah. the conflict. Well, in Colombia, it took four years of negotiations over a 60 year long uh, conflict. I mean, there are examples out there, even though it might take a long time. Uh, uh, Ambassador Sherberg, yep. Uh, ju just what, wanted to echo what, uh, what the minister said about the uh, humanitarian challenges coming up now. There are around 1.5 million people on the move inside Afghanistan according to the latest Janama figures and of course this will need careful, very careful attention uh, uh, during the, the weeks and months to come in particular since we are now into the, the cold season. So this is something that we are monitoring very closely together with the, with the Afghan authorities. And your colleague Mark Bowden, in charge of this at the UN, is coming to Stockholm to yeah. today. I'm sure the UN is is, is doing its uh, part, sharing its part of the responsibility there. Uh, now, I'm sorry this took uh, slightly longer. It was an incredibly interesting discussion. Obviously, only a scratch on on the surface, but but thanks to this fantastic and eminent, incredibly interesting panel, uh, I I am at least much more informed and understand the issues and the challenges and the little opportunities that we have better. So thank you so much and may I invite you in a round of applause to these panelists. Huh? It's been great. Huh? Thank you.